It had been approximately three minutes since the shotgun exploded, sending metal ripping through 17-year-old Jeff McCloskey's arm. While those at the scene fought to save Jeff's life, Jackie Gish ran to the nearest road to help guide the medic unit to her house. I was really scared when I was waiting that they'd come too late and it wouldn't be time enough for Jeff to live. And that's when it really hit me that I might lose this guy who, I mean, for a time he was kind of like my brother. It was a difficult rural address to find. There were several driveways in close proximity and they were not well marked. We were met by somebody out at the end of the driveway who looked quite frantic. And that was the first indication that we had a serious injury taking place. Paramedic Gary Alex and his partner arrived at the farm within six minutes. Anytime we arrive at a scene not expecting something that, that really hits us hard, there's a moment of disbelief. When I saw him, it was like being hit in the face with a two by four. He was bleeding to death. And the only thing that was between him and death was my ability to stop that bleeding. I think if the father had not been controlling that bleeding, the patient would have died uh, probably even before we got there. It's very seldom that we need to use a tourniquet to stop bleeding, but in this case I was unable to use direct pressure. I took a blood pressure cuff and inflated it quite high, putting pressure on that artery. That slowed the bleeding down a great deal. Jeff kept saying, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And we kept reassuring him that he wouldn't. My partner in the meantime was starting an IV because we had to replace fluids that had been lost. I got on the portable radio and radioed to my medical control physician. We're going to need some more and also probably life flight. He's going to need some vascular surgery. The physician agreed that the patient should be life flighted from the scene to Portland uh, to the trauma center up there. He thought he was going to die. If people are severely injured, oftentimes they know they're going to die. And we need to listen to that because sometimes they're right. Jeff, okay. Go ahead and just leave it right there, okay? Jeff's friend was trying to talk him down through all of this, really being good support. There you go. Off-duty paramedic Dale Mount overheard the call for help on his radio and rushed to the scene. I've known Jeff for uh, two or three years. I met him through his father. His father was teaching me how to play guitar. When I first saw Jeff, uh, my thoughts went back to his father. I was on the scene when his father was killed in a motorcycle accident. And I was the paramedic on the scene there. It was tough on me to see Jeff in this much pain, you know, after going through, you know, his father's death. death. Jeff, it's Dale. Yeah. Yes, it is, Jeff. I was thinking, no, this can't happen to Jeff also. And he instantly, you know, Dale, you know, you were with my dad, weren't you? I said, Jeff, yeah. did my dad suffer? I said, no, Jeff, not like you're suffering right now. And then his next concern was that he was going to die. He said, am I going to die? I told him, Jeff, let me tell you something. The worst that's going to happen? And Jeff says, I'm going to lose my arm? I said, yeah, that's it. And I truly you know, thought he had a potential to lose his, lose his life, but I didn't let, want to let on to him that I need, thought that. We needed to find a place to land the helicopter, so we went up by the gate in the small pasture. I let the livestock out of the pasture so that it would be clearer. We had several vehicles to move, and praise the Lord, every vehicle started. In trauma, we're fighting against time. There's a golden hour. If we exceed that, we've lost the battle. And that's not a golden hour of getting him out of the scene in an hour. That's an hour from the time of the incident until he gets to the surgeon. The Life Flight helicopter arrived from Portland in less than 15 minutes. Jeff asked me if I could go along in Life Flight with him. I had to tell him no. I have to stay here. They have a paramedic on board with the Life Flight nurse. There's not room. That caused some distress for Jeff. He really wanted me to go along with him. That's the point where the emotions start to, to well up and, and you just really fight them back and just let Jeff know you're in good hands. I started thinking about what really happened. I started getting real sick. 
I just didn't see why I was the one shooting the gun. It should have happened to me. Then at that point, Christopher finally let down, where at that time we found out he had been hit also. Let's get him on the ground. Lay him down. I saw approximately six pellet wounds across his chest and his throat. There's no way I could tell how deep they were. Any wound to the chest we need to consider as significant. We put him on board the ambulance and began treatment there with oxygen, IVs, and the heart monitor. As it turns out, the wounds were superficial. That is, they were shallow. The more seriously injured Jeff was flown to Emanuel Hospital, where a special trauma team was already waiting for him, headed by Surgeon Ben Bachulis. When they brought Jeff in, it was clear that he was in uh, advanced state of shock. He was very pale, cold, diaphoretic, and I was very concerned about getting control of the hemorrhage and getting some blood back into him. He was bleeding at such a rate that he uh, had lost almost half of his blood volume. Okay, right, right there. Got it? After we had controlled the bleeding, we then evaluated the extremity to see if it could be saved. When we looked at the x-ray, we found that there was a very large piece of metal which was within the depths of the wound. It tore large pieces out of the arteries and veins, but most significant from the standpoint of preserving the extremity was the fact that it tore large segments out of the three main nerves which go from the uh, shoulder down to the hand. In this case, there was no chance at all of saving the arm. Since the accident, Jeff's grown closer to Chris and his family. I don't trust a family more than I trust the Gishes, and I'm glad I could go through it with them, but I'm not glad that they had to go through it with me. Everybody did their part. Nick did his part, and the paramedics did theirs, and Dale did his, and the doctors did theirs. And if anybody would have taken just a minute or two longer, each of them, then that time would have added up in time that I didn't have. There's two attitudes you can have when something like this happens. You can go, woe is me, and you can live that life. You can go, I'm sorry for me, I'm sorry for me. Or you can be a little bit like Jeff and go, hey, the rest of me is all right. You know, and that's the way he's been. He doesn't have both wings, but that's okay. He's going to do what he's going to do anyway. It's not going to slow that boy down. I heard a saying once that says, if it doesn't kill me, it'll make me stronger. And that's so true. Within four months, Jeff relearned how to do everything with his left hand. I knew he was going to be okay when we went out and played tennis together and he beat me. And I was really worried when the accident happened that he would not be able to, to accept not having an arm and he'd just become an introvert and not do anything with his life. And I think he's already proved me real wrong, real quickly. I think we're closer friends now. I think we built a better relationship after this accident. And so I'm not going to let it stop me because I figure if it stops me from doing things that I like to do, then it's defeated me. And I'm not going to let it defeat me. Next. You can be killed in a car crash just as easy as you can be shot. I was scared, scared to death. 